Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of the Compassion and Social Justice Lecture Series. For obvious COVID reasons, this lecture is virtual. Hello, my name is Christopher DeBono, and I'm the Vice President of Mission, People, and Ethics with Providence Healthcare in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. I'm also your moderator today. A special welcome to the over 200 people joining us today, literally from British Columbia, but all the way out to the east to Nova, to Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, and we have some international guests as well. This lecture series is rooted in our institution's commitments to compassion and social justice. Those Catholic organizations are Providence Healthcare, St. Paul's Hospital Foundation, St. Mark's College at the University of British Columbia, and the Archdiocese of Vancouver. True to the Catholic tradition, the goal of these lectures is to advance knowledge and practice in healthcare, and to do it in a specific way by focusing on the human person who is suffering and all of her intrinsic dignity. In this lecture series, we will focus on the people served, but also the people serving. We want to shine a light on the quality of the healing relationships we strive to have in our healthcare institutions. But before we get to that conversation, let us begin in a good way in truth and reconciliation. It is a privilege for me to join with you here on the unceded territory of our three host nations, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Suela Tooth. We are grateful to be guests on these lands. And now a few housekeeping notes for how this hour will unfold. The webinar is being recorded, but only the presenters who are visible on screen are being recorded. So as viewers, you're not on the camera and you will be muted, but there will be an opportunity for you to contribute to the conversation. The lecture will feature two speakers whom I will introduce shortly. Each of them will share for 15 minutes and then we will move to a Q&A conversation. This is a chance, and some of you have already sent in questions, for you to ask a question for me to share with our two speakers. You can do that by tapping the Q&A tab on the right hand of the screen on your monitor. As with every submission of any question online, thank you everyone for respecting the regular norms for online communication. So please submit your questions as you think of them. Don't wait until the end of the two 15 minute segments. Now, with that housekeeping done, let us begin with a welcome from the Archbishop of Vancouver, Archbishop Michael Miller. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the next installment of the Compassion and Social Justice Lecture Series. With COVID-19 still upon us, this series has prudently moved to a virtual platform. As Archbishop of Vancouver, I fully support these lectures. I believe these critical conversations must go ahead, even though we can't meet in person. Today's lecture, entitled Loneliness, Loss and Grief in Time of COVID-19, is especially timely, as its focus is on seniors, long-term care residents and staff, and families affected by the pandemic. I wish to thank Providence Healthcare, St. Mark's College at the University of British Columbia, and the St. Paul's Foundation for making this lecture possible. The Archdiocese of Vancouver is proud to be your sponsor. And to those joining in online, I say thank you, enjoy, engage, and please continue to be an advocate for compassion and social justice in our healthcare system. As the Archbishop mentioned, and as you know from the advertising, our theme today is loneliness, loss, and grief in a time of COVID. In particular, what we hope to achieve in this lecture installment is to get closer to the real experience of people living with COVID in our long-term care homes and the deep questions about clinical work and theology and being human that these encounters raise for us. You and I both know that COVID has changed the way that we interact with each other. And in this lecture, we want to understand what those changes are and what they mean to those in care and those caring. I believe that our two guests today who will be speaking, one a clinician, a physician, and the other who is a clinician and has become a theologian and academic, 
will speak to this reality, what it looks like, what it feels like, the kinds of questions it raises for us, and most importantly, what we can do. I am also aware that many of you watching are yourselves intimately involved in the healthcare system. Some of you are family members as well with your own experiences of those living with COVID-19. I too wanna to thank you for joining us for this conversation, but more importantly, I thank you for the care that you show to those who are vulnerable. And I remind you once again for a robust conversation to please begin to submit your questions. And so this brings me to our first speaker whom I'd like to introduce. I'd like you to welcome Dr. Ken Takano. Ken has worked for over 30 years as a family physician, working in almost every sector imaginable where seniors care is at the center of what he does. And most recently he has turned in his work in long-term care as an arena. And while he has had progressive senior roles in administration at my institution, Providence Healthcare in Vancouver, his passion is most obvious in his work by the bedside in direct care and with our teams and our residents and their families. In particular, we invited Ken today because he was on the front lines of a recent COVID-19 outbreak that we experienced at Providence Healthcare. He will tell this specific and in some ways unique story of a particular outbreak, its effects, its costs, and the concerns it raised for everyone involved. But I would like to suggest that his story is also universal. His is a story where loneliness, loss, and grief are real. In fact, part of our Providence story is that we were trying to change our approach and the national approach to long-term care long before COVID hit. But with COVID-19, everything changed, and ours was a difficult experience. At the same time, it was also a moment of courage and hope. And as you hear from, from Dr. Ken, you will hear the stories of our residents, families, and clinical staff. So thank you, and over to you now, Dr. Ken, and thanks for sharing your experience. As I can unable to start video. Apologies, uh, everyone. Thank you, Christopher. I'm going to start talking, but the video is not connecting. Oh, lovely. Uh, yes. Thanks very much, Christopher. Apologies for the early uh, technical challenge. Um, thank you for that kind introduction, and thanks to everybody on the call today. Um, as Christopher mentioned, I've been practicing family medicine for over 30 years, uh, and the majority of it has been uh, serving our elders uh, in a variety of settings. Uh, and I was certainly um, deeply involved in the outbreak situation at Holy Family Hospital, which is my uh, most recent primary care location. Um, can we start to cue the slides, please? I think they're on. Oh, good. The slides are up. Thank you so much. Um, the, um, the first slide is showing our location. This is Holy Family Hospital. Uh, this hospital is a, a long-term care residence on one floor and a uh, rehabilitation hospital on an, a separate floor. And I happen to work in both of those settings uh, presently. Um, by virtue of uh, anybody entering these doors, by whichever door they enter, uh, it implies that they have suffered significant losses. Uh, losses of function uh, or losses of uh, cognition uh, that have led to them to require either rehabilitation uh, with hopes to return to some form of higher level of function and, and independence. And for those that enter through the long-term care doors, they are really relocating to a new home to live in for the remainder of their days and uh, in as supportive and caring a way as possible. Uh, we could just move the slides on. Uh, so the first slide uh, really depicts one of our long-term care rooms of days past. Um, the situation was not particularly home-like um, and it was uh, 
really rather institutional in its appearance. And unfortunately, the model of care seemed to follow the, uh, the appearance of this, of this situation and was really very institutional in nature. Um, we could just move a slide on. Uh, this slide is depicting what uh, we coined as megamorphosis. This preceded uh, COVID by multiple years, probably five years. Um, our organization undertook to change our way of, of uh, working, of thinking, of caring for our elders to a fashion that was much more directed towards their lives, the quality of their lives, uh, and have them as the central um, figures in, in the day-to-day -day activities of, of our homes. We called this megamorphosis. It meant very large change, uh, and it was indeed a very large change. Um, our goal was to deinstitutionalize care and move towards a social model of care. So I'll try to explain a little bit about how we did this. We can just move on to the next slide. Uh, these are some photos of uh, how the care home looked before COVID, um, again, looking at sort of institutional uh, appearances, um, not a lot of uh, color or life or liveliness. Uh, we can move on another slide. And really this is uh, myself uh, in a not particularly um, flattering photograph of uh, a, uh, a hospital type situation. Uh, the the uh, nursing station, very institutional in appearance, really not at all conducive to calling this place a home where someone would wish to live. And this actually reminds me, uh, a lot of what motivated me to do this work was uh, a desire to, to participate in a process that, that, that could create a place that I might be willing to live sometime should I require that. Uh, and if it's not good enough for me to live in, I don't think I would should ever ask anybody else to live in it. Um, so that was my underlying motivation for my participation uh, and to join into the Megamorphosis project. We can move on a slide. Um, so this is the process or part of the process. This is really the physical changes that we tried to um, achieve in terms of uh, uh, changing the outward appearance of a institutional nursing station into something that looked a little bit more familiar to those. This happens to be one of our care homes that had a, a high proportion of uh, people from Asian backgrounds. Uh, and we hope that this would simulate a tea house um, and uh, really set the stage for a little change in, in function. Let's move on another slide. Uh, more slides uh, just showing the, the outcomes of some of our efforts. I think we'll move through these a little bit more quickly to get onto the COVID. Next slide again. Uh, in, introducing color and life and vibrancy to an, an environment again, not only to change the environment, but to change the relationships of people to, to interpersonal rea um, interactions uh, and away from clinical functions and to really provide people with a sense of home. Let's move on another slide. Uh, again, another uh, outcome slide of uh, changes that are uh, we achieved as a result of megamorphosis, uh, and we were well on our way to um, to rolling out our changes across a variety of sites uh, when a completely unexpected thing happened. Uh, move on to another slide, please. So um, this is one of the early um, slides depicting our outbreak situation at Holy Family Hospital. Uh, this is early June of this year. Um, the pandemic was declared on March the 13th and by June 9th, Holy Family Hospital was declared an outbreak. Um, it completely changed the way of uh, being for everybody, uh, certainly for residents who were relegated to their rooms, we can move on a slide or two, um, changing from a home-like environment with vibrancy and color, another slide two, um, into a place that was completely clinical in nature. This is myself on one of my early visits to the, to the site. It was really a, looking like a, an acute care hospital, an infection control ward, all um, efforts to personalize and uh, add comforts to the environment were completely removed for purposes of infection prevention and control. We can move on another slide. 
Again, some slides showing this is our caring nursing staff, our care staff, you know, they're um, so heavily uh, protected with personal protective uh, um, uh, uh, wear that they, it was impossible to really know who they were, much less have a good interaction with them. Um, so we, we devolved into a situation of uh, numerous people all looking the same and trying to provide care for our residents. Uh, and meanwhile, you can notice that there aren't any residents in any of these photos at all because they were all relegated to their rooms in either complete isolation if they were so fortunate to have a private room or partial isolation if they were in a shared room with other residents. Let's move on to another slide. Um, so some of these uh, residents were, were really affected in a way that uh, um, impacted on their lives quite dramatically. Uh, this particular slide demonstrates a, a person who had regular visits from family who were, were no longer welcome to visit or they were for, not permitted to visit uh, for public health reasons. So interaction was by um, uh, video uh, conference or video presentations, which were really um, a a poor uh, rendition of a physical interaction, but all they could have. Let's just move on to the next slide. Um, I, this is a, a yet another person who was relegated to a, a room by themselves who uh, were devoid of much in the way of interaction with others. Uh, there, were, there were fellow residents in that room, but in fact, their, their ability to have any real quality of life was, was dramatically limited. Um, I think I'm running out of time. So I'm rather than add a little bit more to these uh, uh, clinical anecdotes, um, I'd like to just make some comments about the, the effect on the staff. Um, the, the staff that were providing care for these residents uh, were themselves very traumatized by the, the changes that they were, they were made, that were made to uh, protect our residents' physical being uh, at the expense of their emotional and spiritual uh, lives and, and beings. Um, we had a large number of losses uh, in terms of actual losses of life. Uh, there were 53 residents who were impacted with, with COVID and of those 21 passed um, and the majority of them passed in our care, uh, which was itself very um, heavy uh, burden for our staff to carry. Um, it affected everybody, including the physician staff, uh, the families were impacted in such a way that they were only really permitted to to visit their their loved one as as death became imminent, uh, which was really I think a, a a traumatic way to to say goodbye to your to your loved one of of many years. Um, so, to summarize, um, the impact was widespread across everybody who participated in an outbreak situation from residents through care staff, through families, to, to virtually anyone that had any knowledge at all. Um, and I will say the impact was quite wide reaching. Uh, despite the multiple losses, I believe that there was one aspect of our residents' lives that was not lost, and that was the strength of their spirit and their resilience. Um, and as a way to end in a, in a positive fashion, uh, their spirits did not die with them, uh, but lived on. And I'd like to just share this video clip to, to inspire us as to the strength and resilience of the human spirit. And if we could just cue that video. Hear me now that I'm
Well, special thank you, Ken, for your sharing and for leaving us with that image, that resilient image of spirit about which you spoke that lives in those that we were caring for and in those we continue to care in our staff. I will surely be coming back to your suggestions about reimagining what long-term care could be like and the mix of the personal and the professional reflections. Um, I do pause to remind our, myself and, and all that when we speak of statistics and numbers, as you so rightly say, these are people that are in our care with families, friends, and loved by our staff. I think you've provided a really interesting uh, segue to our next speaker, and I'd like to introduce Dr. John Swinton to you now. Like Ken, John has a clinical background, in his case, having been a registered mental health nurse for over a decade, many years ago, working alongside people with severe mental health challenges who were moving from the hospital into the community. John is also an academic and theologian, a professor at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, from where he joins us today. He has published widely in the areas of mental health, dementia, disability theology, spirituality, healthcare, qualitative research, and pastoral care. We've asked John to come to this conversation from Scotland because we'd like him to share his thoughts on care in a time of COVID. I think what you'll discover, just as Ken is passionate, that John is passionate about people, especially people with vulnerabilities. And he's not afraid to probe what care means, what acts of care mean, and what kindness and love can mean in the kind of work that we do side by side, the vulnerable. Over to you, John. There you go. Well, good evening, or no, it's good evening for me, and good day to everybody else in uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, and welcome and greetings from uh, a very cold and chilly Scotland, but it's a nice place to be nonetheless. The, uh, the kind of title of the presentation that I, I wanted to offer you tonight, tonight today, today, tonight, is um, love in the time of COVID. And I wanted just to think about the nature of love, how that relates to care and how COVID is making certain things complicated. But I'll begin with a, a story. My mother is 96 and she uh, lives on her own in a little village just outside of um, Aberdeen. And she was taken into hospital yesterday because she was, she was very ill. Um, for the past few weeks, she's been really quite unwell with gastric issues and throat issues. And she's been to her doctor again and again and again. And time and again, the doctor just hasn't taken her seriously. He's given her medication that was to cater, her, but actually wasn't helping her. She said to me, you know, I keep telling them again and again and again, that's not the right thing, that, that thing makes me ill. And that, I, I, that's not the way I feel, the way he's describing. And so time and again, she's been uh, kind of put down, patronized, and had a really difficult time. Um, and then yesterday it all came to a, a head and she ended up in, in hospital, which is a real shame because she's a very independent person and it was unnecessary. And it just struck me as I was listening to her story and watching what was happening over the past few weeks, how easy it is for us as professionals to slip into ageism, to discredit people because they're old, to discredit people as sources of knowledge, the things that they know about themselves as because we are professional and you're old then we shouldn't really listen to you. And the way in which being old can sometimes be stigmatized you know, to, to stigmatize something is to, to take one aspect of you and make it everything. So to stigmatize elderly people is to say, well, you're old and that must explain absolutely everything. And the consequences of that kind of ageism and that kind of stigma in my mum's life have been quite horrible, but it happens all the time. Being old can be a lonely place to be, not just because you kind of lose some of your identity when you lose work, when you finish work or because your friends die, but because people look at you differently. People don't take you seriously in, in certain circumstances. And people don't offer you the kind of care and friendship and love that perhaps other people who are younger and fitter and able to uh, talk louder would get. And one thing that struck me, my mom said, 
she said, you know, it was almost like the doctor just wasn't listening to me. And part of the problem, of course, was that she is quite a significant hearing impairment and he was wearing a mask. But beyond that, she said, he just, I kept saying the same things, but he wouldn't listen. For the past uh, few, a year, I've been working with an organization in Australia, looking at carer presence. What does it mean to be present? In this case, my case, specifically with people with um, advanced dementia. Because what this organization had noticed was that carers tended to be in the room, but not really listening, not really aware of what's going on because the person before them is communicating differently. And so therefore they don't see a lot of the things and a lot of the beauty that goes on around them. And so we've been looking at how can we help people to be present? But it's interesting, presence or maybe absence is one of the big problems that we have within contemporary society. You know, in the days when we could go to sit and sit in restaurants, which here has seemed like a long time ago, you see people sitting around the, a table, four people at the table, all on their phones, all speaking to somebody who's not in their immediate presence. Social media gives us this culture of absence. And if we take that culture of absence, that assumption that somehow just to be in the room is enough and put that into a medical context, then you get, well, the kind of situation that my mum faced, where we're in the room with people, but not necessarily of the room with people. I have a, a PhD student who's doing some really interesting work on the very old, as she puts it. Um, and she uh, gave me this little story, which I wanted to, to, to read to you, about um, a couple that she's working with just now. She has uh, the the, cup, the wife of the, the the gentleman that she was talking to has been in care for some time with advanced dementia, and they've had real problems in relation to COVID. Let me read this story to you. Alexander's eighty nine and lives at home, and so his wife has dementia, and he. he under normal circumstances, visits her regularly. She says, he says, I miss my wife every day and I pray that she can die soon. Before lockdown, I visited her, visited her three or four times a week and she knew my name, she gave me a kiss and enjoyed being with me and her daughters. Then lockdown came. I tried to phone as often as I could, but it was difficult. Often she was so too sad to speak. I felt she was missing me. It made me sad as well as, and I cried a lot. I started to wake up uh, at night and prayed that this will change and that we can see and feel each other again. After 10 weeks, I was able to see her again, but she could, couldn't say my name anymore. I tried to sing with her. She could sing the church hymns before. She knew them by heart, but she didn't respond. It was unbearable. And my daughter encouraged me not to go too often. It depressed me, so I felt so much I felt I was losing my strength. I felt weaker than I'd ever felt in my life. I read my daily light, this is Bible readings, every day. But my only comfort is now that both of our weakness lies in the hands of God. I hope that we can both die soon. It's a hard time. And that just struck me as how difficult this time is for elderly people in social isolation. And particularly people with dementia who, even though they're moving along their dementia journey, need stimulation, need relationships, need touch, need to be together. And you can see that very clearly in, in the piece of video we saw earlier, how important that kind of stimulation, that presence of people, and that, in that case, musical stimulation is. You take that out of people's lives and you have a huge hole that cannot be filled. So what I want us to think about is how do we overcome that? Because the danger of, for all of us in relation to COVID is that we get into the habit of social distancing. You know, there's one thing to say we're going to physically distance from people, a public health term to protect us from the virus. Social distancing means that you withdraw from relationships, that you begin to look at everybody as if they're an enemy or a source of infection. And that becomes a culture. So we have a culture of absence, a culture where we're afraid of one another, and a culture where we're afraid of passing on negative things to one another. I want to suggest to you that it's a good time to be thinking about love and begin to think about what love means for us in a professional context. 
And let me uh, let me illustrate something of what I mean. Um, Michael Verdi uh, has a really a nice new video out uh, on on um, dementia. It's called "Love Is Listening," and it says the subtitle is "Dementia Without Loneliness." Right at the beginning of that video, there's a little clip. And it's a clip of an African-American woman with advanced dementia. And she reflects on how she's feeling in the moment. And this is what she says to the person she's speaking to. She says, I don't know where I am. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I've just come from, but I'm not fearful. She pauses and looks deeply into the eyes of the person she's talking to. Because I see all around me. I don't see a lot, but I see patience. And then she looks upwards in a way her eyes kind of glaze over. And she says, I see gratitude. I see tolerance. And then she slowly looks back at her friend and she says, I think I see love. She says, she smiles and says, and your face is a picture of love. And for me, that's, that's, that's a wonderful thing to think about that. Too. When you look at somebody else's face in a caring context, do they see a picture of love? More importantly, in the times of COVID, if you have to wear a mask all day long, how can people see that picture of love written in your face? There's a lot that you can do with your eyes, but you need to intentionally recognize that you need to reveal that love with your eyes. So the idea that we become pictures of love for vulnerable people is really, really important, I think. Now, I want to be clear that when I'm talking about love, I'm, I mean it in a quite specific way. And this is how I'm, I want to think about love. Love's adopting an attitude wherein you look at uh, other people, you value their existence, and you're genuinely glad that they are there. So when you look at somebody, you say, I'm glad that you exist, and it's good that you are here. So if we take that as an understanding of love, that's the exact opposite of stigma. I say exact opposite of ageism. It's precisely the kind of healing attitude that we need in this time of COVID. That our eyes can show that idea that it's good that you're here and I'm glad that you exist. Let's see what we can do uh, together. And so the thing I need to, to think about is how can we engage with one another? How can we engage in our caring practices in a time of COVID uh, in a way that reveals the beauty and the love of human relationships? Because if we don't do that, we're going to get in the habit of not loving, and that's even more dangerous as when people become really, really vulnerable. So two things to think about. Love requires presence. So the first thing that we think about is how can we communicate love through our presence? And in order to do that, we need to be present. So there's something profoundly important about recognizing the significance of being in the moment as a, as a way of being with people in the time of COVID, in the time of suffering, in the time of aging. There's a, within the Christian tradition, there's, a, there's a, a, a spiritual discipline called the sacrament of the present moment. I think it's good time for us to reclaim that. Sacrament of the present moment says that every moment that we have is given to us by God, and we need to recognize that. And so every moment that you have is a gift. If you think that way, then you can be present with people. If you're present with people, then you'll listen to them. If you listen to them, then you'll actually hear what they're saying and respond to their needs in ways that are meaningful and positive. So that simple act of present, present being present, it's countercultural. Breaks through ageism, breaks through uh, distancing, and opens up a new space. The second thing I, I want us to think about is the idea of learning to wait. One of the most complicated things that that um, uh, that we can do oftentimes as care is waiting to see what's going to happen next. It's particularly when you're working in the area of, of you know acute care where somebody's always waiting for results. But waiting is something that's really important because when we're waiting, we're always waiting for something. 
if we're waiting for something, then there's always possibility and hope. So when we wait with an elderly person, when we just sit there waiting, working through what the next phase in is in life, when we wait with someone with a profound disability, when we wait with somebody with dementia, we're actually adopting a position of hopefulness because we don't just wait for waiting sake, we wait for something to come. And the key thing is, what is that something to come? And it's always something positive. And the third thing that we need to think about in relation to love is the idea of homefulness. Your home is the place where you um, experience love, love for the first time and where you experience love all through your, your life in that sense. So there's very, something very important about being at home in the place that you are. Let me talk about care homes, but how homely are our care homes? But that idea of homefulness, being at home in the world, it's a theological idea. You know, God creates human beings and says to them, you're at home in the world. The world is yours. Look after it. Care for it. And bring into that place of home the broken, the weak, the lost, those who have no home. So that idea of homefulness, if we think about it in a professional context, is a place where we practice love. We create spaces of homefulness within our professional context where people can encounter identity, love, peace, and a safe space to be able to be with one another in the world. So if we begin to think about love in that way, love being, you know, I'm glad that you exist and really uh, glad that you're here. If we think about that as a basic principle for our Karens, then uh, all sorts of wonderful things happen. Um, now, it's dangerous and it's risky. As soon as we enter into the idea of, of love, people will start to tell us about professional boundaries, about risk, about uh, too many expectations, about losing your identity or overstepping marks. All of these things are really, really important. But these are challenges. These are not barriers. And think about it. What would it look like to care without love? We, can, we can't love without care and we can't care without love. So reclaiming that is something profoundly important. Because if the GP had loved my mum in that way, then she probably wouldn't be in a hospital just now. So I learned that lesson and I, I just want to share that lesson with you. If we can reclaim love in a time of COVID, then we have new possibilities, new hopes and new expectations for positive futures. I'm going to invite both of our speakers to turn their microphones on and their cameras back on. And while you're, they're doing that, um, John, I want to thank you for inviting us into that relational space, that, that space of love. And I'm going to be coming back at you with a question that I'd like to share with Ken as well about this. Um, and I'll just set that up while Ken's uh, camera is coming on. Um, when you talk about presence and waiting and homefulness, um, I, I have a, a deep sense, and correct me if I'm mishearing you, of the kind of attitude or disposition one brings to what we do. Uh, and I look across the, the more than 200 people that are on this broadcast right now, and many of them are probably struggling, whether they're clinicians or family members, of how to reclaim some of that disposition. And I know you're inviting us to do that. And I heard Ken talking about that as well. So I'm gonna put you a little bit on the spot and I'd like you both, if you can, to tell me where does that fire, where does that motivation and dare I call it hope come from within you to be challenging us to do this kind of engagement? And you can choose who wants to go first. I'm happy to start from the personal uh, and perhaps medical perspective, um, based on our work with megamorphoses in the past, it was a wonderful experience and really, I believe love and homefulness was our goal. Um, and not that that's a goal that you can ever achieve, but you work towards, and we were certainly advancing in that direction only to see it dashed uh, in an effort to sustain life at the expense of, of spiritual and personal uh, uh, sensation and um, emotional reaction. Um, 
my challenge is, uh, or my response is really that we have to really move back in that direction uh, and try to find a way to, to do that, to rebuild some form of homefulness in a setting that remains quite high risk. Um, and this is, uh, I don't believe that it's all about physical appearance. It's about human interaction and human caring. And uh, I don't, I think that that is possible and, uh, and, and should be promoted and supersedes the, the potential threat of harm. Really what we've seen is touch is no longer a comforting touch. It is a, it has become a, a physical touch for purposes of providing physical care rather than for providing sort of emotional and, and, and uh, spiritual comfort. Thank you, uh, Ken. Over to you, John, and then let's, let's we'll engage this in a little bit of a conversation together. It's great an opportunity to have the three of you so intimately on the screen. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think uh, oh, for, for me, it, it comes from a kind of um, humanitarian impulse that I, I, I just like people. I, I don't mean that in, in a kind of, I, I, I'm a nice person. I just think I like people and I, I'm hopeful about the, the possibility that people can do good things. Um, that given the right circumstances, given the right education, given the right context, people will tend to do good things rather than bad things. And so I, th I think that the the um, the impulse or the way into to begin to get people to see the significance of these things for their life is, is through education. I think that um, one of the things that, that I, I've noticed here is that certainly if you take, for example, the way that doctors are, are trained, they're trained as clinicians, they have a very particular understanding of knowledge, which really comes through randomized control trials it is the way in which you find truth. Um, and, and everything else is, is secondary to that. And of course, that's an important way of looking at the world. But what I do notice is that if you, when we work, having worked alongside medics, less so nurses, but medics, once they um, begin to think about these wider dimensions of, illness experience, once you realize that all illness is actually a story in which you're participating and which has a beginning, a middle and an outcome, which is not determined simply by, by treatment goals, then people begin to see things differently because they see the person in front of them differently. So it's, it's adjusting people, people's vision to, to always see people rather than issues. That's the beginning part for that. And I think that's an educational issue. It's also a spiritual, it's your spiritual formation, but however you're, you're, you know, what you're, to some extent, you see the things that you've been formed to see. Thanks, uh, Ken and John. I, I, I know it, at Providence, part of what we, we, we are trying to do with, with our staff is to think about what, uh, how one fits within that that, that meaning of encounter that you're speaking about. So the word of education or formation is, is part of our culture. Um, this question is reminding me of, of, uh, of one that's come up from those listening, and it's and I'd just like to switch the gears a little bit. The question is, um, moving away from the idea of what is motivating you, is to what advice do you have for new medical staff in the mind shift from institution to home? And what examples can you give that might navigate our priority for the whole person? And uh, perhaps I can start with you again, Ken and, and John, after that. Uh, thanks, um, Christopher. Uh, one of the things that actually drew me to care of the elderly uh, and care of elders, uh, notwithstanding my love and respect for people of all ages and all abilities, um, was that there was a great appreciation for any efforts to provide care and comfort, irrespective of the diagnosis, irrespective of uh, the treatments, and it really, what it really showed me was that there's an art uh, to medicine, which really I believe is also based in caring and love. Uh, and any effort to um, support someone's comfort and um, and um, sense of well-being, irrespective of the physical condition that you that might be in front of you, uh, it is highly appreciated without an expectation of cure. Um, and this is a 
it's really the, the concept of palliation and palliative care. It is providing comfort uh, and support and, and love for, for want of a less uh, clinical term um, or less a more clinical term uh, that really is, is highly appreciated and gives me as much satisfaction as anything. Uh, and it's really, it was a drawing point for me. So in terms of new recruits and new people coming into the field, it's, it's getting beyond needing to know all the answers and having all of the solutions and cures and really looking at the person in front of you and saying, what can I do for you today to make this day better for you? Uh, and if you can help them even for one day, they'll, that's a satisfying and appreciated undertaking. Thank you, Ken. Over to you, John. Yeah, I mean, there's not much more I would say to that. I think that's a, it's a really good response that Ken has given. Um, the only thing I would, I would add is it, it's probably useful to think about expanding our vocabulary. And so alongside of clinical uh, language, to use language like love and compassion and care, and not as kind of secondary things to the clinical task, but actually as, as, as a way of reframing and rethinking things. Um, because we tend to, the way that you, you name something kind of determines what you think it is and what you think it is determines how you respond to it. So the kind of language we use in a clinical context is, is important because it, it kind of tells us how we should respond. You know, the difference between a patient and a person, for example, this between a unit and a home, these are huge differences um, if we think them through. I think just expanding our vocabulary and giving credibility to forms of language that may not have kind of scientific weight in the way that some other forms of language, but actually in terms of human experience and the things that our patients want um, is fundamentally important. And that way you change your mindset. Thanks, John and Ken. Um, there's a whole series of questions that, that this conversation is generating online. Um, which I think does um, link to this idea of how we're approaching things. So the particular question I want to share with you is, is the following. While no one believes that protecting physical life is the only thing that matters, that sometimes seems to be what our actions say. And um, so again, that, that, that physical life seems to be the only thing that matters, but that's what our actions seem to say. Uh, I know in terms of administration and managing um, our different centers, there has been a real tension that this question evokes for me between how far to lock down units, frankly, and how to think about what people need. So I'd like to, I'd like to invite your reflections on this. This time, John, perhaps I'll start with you and then we'll go to Ken. And it's just that, again, that tension about basically removing all of the things that people find helpful in their lives. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak for your particular geographical context, but I can speak from our part. One of the big problems is that people don't really have any narratives to, to uh, articulate death. Uh, in other words, um, the only thing that we can say about death is, is language that can, can help us to avoid it. So if we're faced with a situation where uh, it may be that you know, good numbers of people die, the automatic response is to look how, how can we save lives in that sense. Nothing wrong with that, but it means that those who are dying, uh, it, means that, it means that we don't have a narrative to be able to talk about um, how we can incorporate death into our processes of life in that way. And so the, the narrative of COVID here is driven by a certain kind of fear. And that's primarily the fear of death and the inability to cope with the possibility that we, it turns out we're all mortal. So I think there's a kind of cultural, spiritual barrier there that, that stops us from responding to a pandemic like this, for example, in a way other than your standard defensive step, step back and let's do everything we can to avoid death. So I think it, it, there's an underlying spiritual problem that comes to the fore uh, when we're faced with this kind of major tragedy. Thanks, John. Uh, Ken, what are your thoughts on this? Yes, and I would agree with John on many of those points. Um, we certainly struggled with this in actuality at the, at the outbreak. Um, the challenge uh, of caring for a large number of people with a 
a diverse backgrounds really complicates the, the answer um, because the sentiments uh, vary to complete polar opposites. Um, I had heard from some individuals, uh, number one, that they'd rather die of COVID than die of loneliness. Uh, so that was one um, very um, extreme uh, position. And towards the other end of the spectrum, there were, were folks and families uh, supporting those folks who, to whom death uh, was absolutely the worst possible outcome of the physical, the end of the physical life was the worst possible outcome and must be uh, prevented or protected for as long as possible. Um, and both of these um, sort of every virtual, virtually every uh, permutation of those in between exists in a, in a care setting where many people live. Um, so then it's a matter of deciding which direction do we favor in terms of of uh, providing care and in the public health perspective, uh, the direction was protect the physical life um, at the expense of the uh, spiritual, emotional and uh, other aspects of life that were of great value to those. So it was a, it served a portion of the population but uh, did not serve the other portion of the population. Thanks for that, uh, Ken, and, and thank you, John. Um, not surprisingly, there are a number of questions emerging around um, the relationships we have with those that are um, cared for in our institutions that are often now with lockdowns. Um, let me ask you this. You're being asked to, um, to comment on, on feelings of guilt and remorse that family members and even perhaps staff may have when their loved ones are not able to be with them during this time of illness and, and, and sometimes death. Um, so what would you say to a family member who is angst about the fact, a bit like your story, John, that you shared, um, and I know, Ken, we see this all the time. What, what advice would you give to those, those family members? And whoever's got the hottest idea is welcome to start. <laughs> Please do. The, the, I mean, the, the, the only thing I would say would be, um, I think guilt is, is the wrong, I think disappointment and a sense of lament and sadness is a correct way to approach you know, the feelings I have. I think guilt's not because it's, it's completely with your control. So therefore there's nothing to be guilty about in that sense. But having deep frustration. So, I mean, even with my own, minor crisis you know so my mum's in the hospital but we can anybody's anybody in hospital can only have one visitor and that's a dedicated visitor which is my sister so uh, I, I that sense of frustration that sense of feeling that you should be with with I feel that it should be with my mum feeling that I should be doing more I can identify with that completely but I don't feel guilty about it because there's nothing I can do about that and I think these are unusual times. I mean, very few of us have ever experienced anything like this before and never will again. So I think you've got to take cognizance of that. But it's that disappointment, that sense of lostness and that sense of frustration, which I think needs to be articulated. People should speak about that and just say that that's what it is, but not guilt. Because I think that's not, that, it's not something to be guilty about. I'd agree with that, uh, John. Um, we certainly saw a wide range of emotions coming from families. Um, I will say that I had many conversations with families, both when uh, residents were diagnosed with COVID and should they have taken a significant turn that looked like they might not be uh, coming out um, the other end. Um, and the range of emotions were from, there certainly was a fair bit of anger and a, a sense of um, unfairness. And it was very to share their share anger because uh, I was equally angry at COVID for affecting their parent or uh, loved one. Uh, and we could, if we could focus our, our emotional response on the, the actual agent that was the, the causal problem, uh, it allowed us to strengthen our own relationship in a way that built great trust and rapport in a way that I had not felt before. So um, I think that it was, uh, and I will say that I, 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 I can't say that guilt was a, set, a emotion that was often 
shared to me. Uh, it was more about, again, the anger and frustration about how unfair this situation is. And it, ha it is, it was, it is, and it will be uh, until it is contained or controlled or otherwise uh, we've come to terms with it. Thank you, Ken, and thanks, John. And, and, and I'm really appreciating, partly with my ethics background, the reframing that both of you are doing as well on, on, on how we engage in these very difficult relationships and uh, just underscoring that our approach can often open doors or in some ways hinder us. So the formation and the, the depth of this conversation for me, and again, for the over 200 people online, I, I hope has been as, as much um, heartwarming and, and illustrative of just what critical thinking can offer. I'm aware that we're at our last minute and I just want to say thank you. I want to thank you, John, and, and you, Ken, for sharing your insights and joining us electronically, this side of the ocean and your side of the ocean. I also want to thank the Archdiocese, which has made funds from the Archbishop's Dinner that have contributed to the Catholic Healthcare Ethics Fund that make these kinds of conversations possible. On the slide, you're going to see um, a number for other contacts and information as we close. But I just wanted to let people know that did submit questions, and there were many of them that we could not get to, that we will endeavor to provide a response to those questions. Um, and then let me end again with a deep sense of gratitude. Um, it is often said that we're in this together, and I think this conversation reveals that that, that is sometimes true, and that sometimes we need to work harder for those that are marginalized and are at the deeper ends of, of the effects of COVID. Um, part of this lecture is to pull everybody up with a sense of hope and a sense of possibility and the critical questions that we can work on together. So thank you, John, thank you, Ken. A very big thank you to the organizers of this particular event, uh, Shelley Sainsbury and the St. Paul's Foundation that coordinated the platform for us. It has been very, very good for us to be with you. I wish you a great afternoon and John, a good night where you are. Take care, everybody, and bye for now. Bye, everybody.